Yeah, during Sabbath school, Martin Luther was talked about, and he truly was, after a time, a faithful follower of God. Early in his life, he followed what he knew to be right through the teaching of tradition. But he was bold enough to put tradition aside and turned to the Word of God and be led by God and led in a powerful way. And right till the end of his life, he was a faithful follower. Tragically and sadly, the Lutheran church has not adopted that same attitude. Sadly, they have not been faithful to what, to the faith that Martin Luther established them in the platform on which they were built. And as you study through history, it doesn't matter when, a lot of organizations have failed in leading God and leading on God's behalf. And although there have been wonderful individuals in that organization that has brought them to a place of knowledge, Unfortunately, upon their death, there was nobody to keep it going. And they imploded. They, they, they fell apart from the inside. And as you study through history, when churches get to that fifth, sixth generation of existence is the time when they fight for survival. They fight to be meaningful, to be relevant, and to continue to be led by God. Because after the establishment of four or five generations, tradition set in. And even with most probably within our own organization, in our own family environments, traditions are most probably taking over. We have people, we have young people that are born into a church that are not converted into a church. And if you ask them why are they a Seventh-day Adventist, it's because my parents were. It's because their parents were. Because their parents were, and so out of tradition, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. And so like most churches that have been raised up by God to do a work, we are in that critical phase ourselves of being, still being led by God and not allowing our own thoughts and our ideas of being taken over. That's it about Martin Luther today, okay? I don't want to preach more about him. I want to take you to the Word of God today and not the writings of, of an individual. Um, I want to take you to God's penman himself. And I want to take you to a little book today, a little letter that there is no dispute over who wrote it and what it's about. It's a beautiful little letter, and I want to take you there, but before we do, let's just pray. Father God, it's time for your word and your thoughts to have supreme place. We thank you that we've sung these beautiful hymns that we have, penned by people who have had experiences with you and have been able to craft these, these beautiful words that have been put to music that lets our hearts sing about you and praise you. And now we come to the Word, and we want to open the Word, dear Lord, to a letter, a little letter, the second epistle of Peter. And we want you through this letter today, dear Lord, to speak to our hearts. And may we find encouragement here as we continue to press on, press on, reforming the world, reforming our lives, our lives tuning them into a harmonious relation with you and I pray that as we worship you today we will do so in Jesus name amen so yes I want to take you to the to the second epistle oops where did we go what have I done here <laughs> thank you Lockie's up the back he's the man that can sort out most things so yeah I want to take you to the second epistle of Peter which in minute understanding and, and giving it a, a, a reference point, it is 
nothing but a, other than a word of warning. This is what it's about. But what, what is it he's going to warn about? What, what is on his heart? And why does he take um, this subject and why does he develop this aspect of warning? In the outline of the epistle of Second Peter, is, it's very simple. It's not complex. It's not like Romans. It's not like Galatians. It's not hard to know what it's on about. And the first thing that we learn is that it's a, a point of guidance for growing Christians. Okay? He wants to guide us as Christians. And then he wants us to understand the danger to growing Christians. There is a danger in growing Christians. And what does he talk about? And also, there is hope for growing Christians. And this is what this little epistle is about. It's about guidance, it's about danger, and it's about hope. Now, what is it that makes and motivates Peter to write this letter? What's, what's really going on in his life? And what makes him want to write this letter? I want you to come to verse 12. You'll need to open your Bibles. I don't have the text up on the screen. But in Second Peter chapter 1, he starts off in verse 12 with this little phrase, for this reason. So it's very clear. Right here, at this point now, we're going to give, be given understanding as to why he's taken up the pen and why he's writing this le reason. He says, for this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things. Though you know and are established in the present truth. So here Peter is talking to believers, okay? People who have a relationship with Christ, people who are connected to, to church, people who believe the teachings of, of God as taught by the disciples, as taught by Jesus. So he's talking to people who are established, and I believe, folks, I believe today that you are established. Yes, I think it is right. As, lie, as long as I am in this tent to stir you up by reminding you, knowing shortly, knowing that shortly I must put off my tent, just as our Lord Jesus Christ showed me. Moreover, I will be careful to ensure that you always have a reminder of these things after my decease. Okay? So Peter is taking up the pen, and because he is about to be crucified, because he is about to die the way that Jesus said he would, because that is about to happen to him, he says, I'm going to write down some things because I don't want you to forget them. That's as simple as that. He's, he's passing on, he's performed his ministry, and now he starts to write down some thoughts that are important for us to hold on. Peter in his life, just think about this for a moment. Peter in his life had witnessed and experienced many interesting events. Peter's life was not boring. Okay, he, did, he had plenty to write about. Much happened in his life. Some of those events were very personal. Very personal. Others were meant to be shared by all. The crucifixion of Christ, shared by all. But the courtyard scene, the rebuke by Christ, they were personal events in his life. Walking on water, nobody else tasted that. That was Peter's own experience. And so he had very personal experiences. He had corporate experiences and he, he, share, he wants to take from those moments 
and give us some encouragement. It's because Peter was very impetuous. You didn't know what he was going to do next or say next. He was unpredictable. And it's because of that impetuous nature, his life was one very, very interesting life indeed. But in all of that, he had a very intimate association with Jesus. When Jesus asked the question of Peter, Peter, who, who do people say I am? Peter said, oh, yeah, I've got a handle on that. They say you're this and they say you're that. But then Jesus said, but Peter, who do you say I am? And Peter comes forth, you're the Christ. Peter was the first person who declared and acknowledged that he knew who Jesus was. Many, many times, Peter was challenged to get out of his comfort zone. You know, the, 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 one of the main reasons why we struggle with our Christian experience is we, are, we want to stay in that zone of comfort. And in doing that, we shape our own belief system. We shape our own experience. Peter knew that he was not going to grow in Christ unless he got out of his own comfort zone and went where Christ wanted him to go. And, and at one point, God sent down that sheet from heaven with all of these unclean animals and says, Peter, eat! Uh -uh. Peter wouldn't do that, but he struggled to understand why. And eventually through the this, this struggle he has with God and with Christ, he eventually understands and he's led to Cornelius. Let's have a look at verse 2 of chapter 1. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. As his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by his glory and virtue, by which have been given to us, notice what he says next, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through these you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Oh, yeah, poor Peter here goes straight into the argument. He goes straight into the defense of God, and our need for God is to protect us from the corruption that is in the world. And you and I right now are living in that place that Peter's talked about, a corrupt world, a corrupt environment, a corrupt place. Verse 5. But also for this reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith, virtue, to virtue, knowledge, to knowledge, self-control, to self-control, perseverance, to perseverance, godliness, to godliness, brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness, love. Yeah, Paul, Peter doesn't argue using the things that Paul argues the things of the human flesh versus the things of, 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 of the spiritual life. He doesn't argue that way. Instead, he talks about growing, us growing, getting better, taking under control these, these issues that are important and powerful and can change us and help us. Look at verse 8. He says, For if these things are yours and abound, 
you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, he's hit the nail on the head right here. And he's, he's, he's given us a picture of the majority of the people of the world. They are barren, they're empty vessels because they have not embraced this attitude of Christ, of Jesus. Come to verse 10. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be even more diligent. Oh, okay. Be more diligent, he says, to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you will neither stumble, for so an entrance will be supplied to you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Saviour. So Peter's primary reason for writing this little epistle is so that we will not stumble. We will not fall out of grace, out of the grace of God. We will not be lost. And so he goes on and he talks about these things. Have a look at verse 16. For we... Who's he talking about here? We. For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses. Here he talks about that that, that group, the disciples, now apostles of Christ. He says, look, folks, you need to understand that we did not follow cunningly devised fables. In other words, people did not sit in isolation and dream up these concepts of a Jesus on a cross, of a Jesus who was resurrected, of a Jesus who comes back and is witnessed by disciples. None of that, he says, was dreamed up. It's real. We saw it. You need to believe it. And I want to say right now, there's never been a time like now to believe it. Did you know that after I preached on Sabbath, hear about us coming into that place of Jesus and being into the place of Jesus, that I had a couple of young people came to me and says, -uh, we don't think that Jesus stacks up. We don't think that Jesus is all that Scripture has said. He's not the Messiah. He's not who you said he is. And I said, so on what authority have you come to that conclusion? And they said, the YouTube. YouTube tells me that Jesus is not the fulfillment of Scripture, and that he's still to come that he's still to come. And that scared me. That scared me. That frightened me. These young people are people, are children of parents that are faithful in the church. But they have issues. I don't know if their parents even know that they have issues. But it's real. And here we are, we're the, 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 the Mr. Google YouTube is just flooded with cunningly devised fables. But because they are where they are, boom, they're an authority. They are in a voice. I've left a couple of PowerPoints out. Where are we? We've been there. These are just some points that come from that. A faith as precious as ours. You know, Peter's desire is for us is to have a faith like theirs, strong. It was so strong that they died for their faith. They could not, they would not and could not waver from it. Grace and peace, he says, 
is to be ours in abundance. His divine power has given us everything we need. And this is, this is Peter's argument. There's nothing else that we need. The divine power of God has given us. And he's given to us his very great and precious promises. That word precious is a powerful word. And the only way we can explain what that word precious is is to go back to the time when God gave Jesus, okay? God gave to us the, the most precious gift that he could give. And Ellen White says that all of heaven was emptied in the giving of Jesus to us and that God could give no more than what he did. He gave us the absolute best perfect gift and that same reference is in this passage in Peter to where these promises that are given to us are just as precious as that gift of Jesus because the promises that have been given to us are from Jesus himself and it's a beautiful thought that Peter brings to us here Second Peter 1 verses 16 to 21 establish three absolute assurances. Now, in today's environment of a postmodern society, most people would like to cross out that word absolute and just say, okay, Peter states three assurances. I want to say that what Peter states are set in concrete, and they are absolute. They are unchangeable assurances. We did not follow cleverly invented stories. That is an absolute truth, and yet people will argue it, and people will come along and say, hey, they had too much wine, this happened and that happened, and they will argue it. I want to say, let us never get to the point where we argue the things of Scripture. They are not cleverly invented stories. They are truth because Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. The second point that we get out of this passage of Scripture is we have the word of the prophets made more certain. Who's he talking about here? when he talks about the word of the prophets made more certain. He's talking about the Old Testament prophets who gave them the Messianic understanding of Christ. And so there's all of those prophecies. There's the prophecy in the book of Daniel. There's all of these other prophecies scattered. There's prophecies relative to Israel that came true not just relevant to Christ, but there's all of these prophecies. So Peter is saying, look, we are testament. We have the word of the prophets. It's made more certain because Christ fulfilled all of those and we are living proof of the words of those prophets. And then he goes on to say that no prophecy of Scripture came about by the prophet's own interpretation. Everything that we have in here is directed from God. Although men wrote it down, it is directed from God. Now, having said all of that, having laid that platform, having stirred us up and saying, look, you believe the truth, you have this knowledge, you need to hold on to all of this, when he comes to chapter 2, he rocks everyone's boat. Oops. I think I hit the wrong one, Lockie. Not your fault. <laughs> okay. When we come to chapter 2, here we are, we're back on. This is where the warnings come in. And I want to say to you, friends, children of God, this chapter we need to pay respect to. This is the one chapter in scripture that will help us right now to get through the crisis that's happening in the world 
The world is telling us right now that it's okay for a man to marry a man and a woman to marry a woman and you know it just goes on and it goes on. The world is dictating to us our belief system. And it's in the context of this because what's happening now in the world is no different than what happened just when Peter was about to be crucified. Just as the world is now under attacking, attacking the authority of God, the authority of his word, the place of his word in society, the same thing was happening just before Peter was crucified. Let's have a look at what he says of these warnings. False prophets and false teachers would come. They would introduce destructive heresies. They would make up stories, start telling made-up stories. They would say, the Lord knows how to rescue godly men from trials. And so this is, this is, this is part of his warning that trials are coming, but God is there and he has the ability to be able to rescue. Let's just leave them on the screen for a moment. And let's just have a look at part of chapter 2 here. Verse 1. But there will also, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who brought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. Okay, this is happening. I want to say that this is even happening within Adventism. Okay? There is at the moment a huge push in the world for the resurrection of the nation of Israel, not just through the Zionist movement. But for that to happen, they have to get rid of Jesus Christ. They have to take Jesus out of the picture and make him of no significance. So at the moment, there is a power that is influencing the thought that Christ did not fulfill the types of the Old Testament. And that the festivals of the ancient Jewish calendar need to be celebrated by even Adventists today. And this is what was happening in the time of Peter. There was a huge push to remove Jesus from the psyche and the thinking of believers. And so they were at that time discrediting Christ as a fulfillment of the Old Testament. They were discrediting Jesus and doing everything that they could. And they were making up all sorts of theories, all sorts of teachings. And I want to say that all of those teachings that were brought to power at that time are being resurrected right now and being introduced into the Christian church. And that is, that is a huge, huge tragedy that is happening and we need to be on guard. Parents, you need to know what your young people are thinking and what they are studying and what they are learning because more and more we're becoming aware that they are thinking and believing different than we are. And that is a tragedy. Many will follow destructive ways because of whom the way of truth will be blasphemed. By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. For a long time their judgment has not been idle and their destruction does not slumber. For if God did not spare the angels who sinned but cast them down to hell and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment, and did not spare the ancient world but saved Noah, one of eight people, 
a preacher of righteousness bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. And then he goes on and talks about Sodom and everything else. Let's come down to verse 9. Then the Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust under punishment for those who walk according to the flesh and the lust of uncleanness and despise authority. They are presumptuous, self-willed. They are not afraid to speak evil of dignitaries, whereas angels who are greater in power and might do not bring a reveling accusation against them before the Lord. Notice what he's talking about here. He's talking about the way we go about saying things, doing things, critical attitudes, critical spirits, and they develop and they, they build up and they fester and they cause these multitude of problems. And that was was happening way back then. So Peter had a very good understanding of the doom and of the trouble that would come. And then he turns to chapter 3. He turns to chapter 3. And this is where he develops the message of hope. We're, face, we're going to face some very challenging times. We're going to face some very critical times. We're going to be, we're going to be challenged in many ways. And particularly the longer we go to the coming of the Lord, the more the, the, the churches, the daughters of Babylon align and give more power to the mother of Babylon, then we as an Adventist church are going to be out there in the cold. We're going to be out there on our own. We're going to be the only ones defending the faith of God and the righteousness of Christ and that's going to make it extremely difficult for us. And this is where Peter comes along and he says, don't worry. Don't worry about what happens at that time. You need to know that God's got your back. You need to know that God is going to, to uphold you for being faithful. Verse 1 of chapter 3. Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of us, of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Saviour, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lusts and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old and the earth standing out of water and in water by which the world that then existed perished being flooded with water. But the heavens and his earth which are now preserved by the same word are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition. Hey guys, he says, hold on, hang on. Just remember what God's already done in the past. He's done it once, he'll do it again. And he says, hold on. Verse 8, but beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day. He says, folks, just be patient. Don't lose any sleep over the fact that he's not here today and he's not here tomorrow. Don't, don't lose any sleep. For he says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. Some count slackness, but is long suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You know, sometimes we put the cart before the horse and we get despondent when we read about the stuff that's coming. But when you read the positive stuff, you delight. Who knows what's going to happen in the Christian world after Tuesday when the Lutherans and the Catholics are lying. Who, who knows what's going to happen? 
There may be God's wonderful, faithful people there and they will at that moment discern that they've been in the wrong boat all their lives and they want to now leave and find where God is. They may just wake up on Tuesday and find out, hey, we haven't been listening to this after all. We've only been listening to what man said. And who knows? Next Sabbath, the church might be full because they've seen the folly of the ways. Who knows what's going to happen? And maybe the Lord is waiting for this moment in the history of time. Verse 11. Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? Nevertheless, even though all of that stuff is being talked about, he says, nevertheless, we according to his promise, Look for a new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. Hey, don't get caught up. Don't get caught up in the negative stuff. We've got to stick with the positive. We must recall the words spoken by the prophets. That's what he says. We must recall. We must remember what's been said because nothing has changed. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today and forever. And what he taught to Adam in the Garden of Eden, what he taught in the time when he lived on the earth before he died on the cross, and what he would teach us now is exactly the same. It's no change. We must recall that the words of the spoken by the prophets is true. He warns of the danger of apathy. Okay? That's the opposite of hope, is to be apathetic and not be concerned. But So he warns of the danger of that, and he wants us to be the opposite of that. He puts emphasis to the coming of our Lord. And he says the Lord is not slack in keeping his promises, and he quotes the flood and other stuff there throughout his little letter, reminding us that he's faithful and if he says something, he means something, and he will do something. We must be continually watching, for the Lord will come like a thief. And yes, there is a danger for some that are not staying focused. They will be in a place not prepared, and the the coming of the Lord could come upon them as a thief. Let's have a look at these last few points that he labours. We must be looking forward. What's next? What's next? We must be looking forward. And we must make every effort. If we don't know something about God and if there's stuff that we've heard people say and we're not sure whether it's right or not, we need to make, out, we need to make the effort to find out whether it is truth, whether it is of God. We must be making every effort to obtain our salvation. And Peter says, be on guard. These monsters are going to come into your community. These, 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 these wicked people, these, these false teachers, these false prophets, they're going to come in and they're going to say all sorts of things. And we've seen this happen so many times, so many times. 1863, when the Adventist church was born, the devil didn't sit down and let it happen without any controversy, without him trying to disrupt us so next door what does he do he gives birth to mormonism what else does he do he gives birth to the jehovah witness he gives birth to the modern day spiritualism through the fox sisters there is never a time in this world when the devil is not prepared to take on god and god's people 
And he's doing it right now in our own community, in our own church. And so we need to be on God. What is it that people are saying? Friends, if you hear and you're sitting down with some fellow believers and they start talking about something, and you need to let me know if you, if you think there's an issue. You need to let me know so I can, I can protect the community. We can't have one little house group meeting here and sharing these thoughts and another little house group over there meeting those thoughts. We've got to be united in the Word of God. We've got to stand true for what God is. And we've got to protect His truth. For we are the protector of His truth. We are raised up to be that. What else does he have to say? Do not fall from your secure position. I think that's the scariest part of the, this little book is where Peter says, hold on, hold on to what you have. Be, be, be established. Don't fall from your secure position. And unfortunately, we see many people fall from the secure position of once being in a place of, of knowing who God is, knowing what God is and how that, that God has taken care of them and then all of a sudden one day it means nothing to them. They've fallen from that secure position of being in a safe place with God. We need to guard against that. The Lutheran church has fallen from that secure position. I believe the Lutheran church, if faithful, could have become the Adventist church quite easily. And Martin Luther was certainly on a journey of discovery. Martin Luther is actually known to have studied the Sabbath. They found documentation of such in his library. But when questioned as to why he wasn't presenting the truth, he said, a man in his lifetime can only do a certain amount of things. And he believed it was more important that he give the world the understanding of righteousness by faith than he did of a day of worship. And had he spread himself so thin, who knows, we might not yet even be understanding righteousness by faith. But the tragedy of it is that when he ceased to exist, his community of faith didn't continue the work. We've got to make sure that we're all playing our part. We've got to make sure that we're not resting on the laurels of the person that has gone before us. We've got to continue ourselves to protect our own faith and grow our own faith. It's important that we do that. He goes on to say, but we are to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to grow in grace and knowledge. Our experience is to be growing. Not just our knowledge in our head to be growing, but our experience with Christ has to be growing as well. You can't have one without the other. You can't fill your head with knowledge and it means nothing that you don't do anything about it. You can't just go out there and do what you think is right without having the knowledge that is motivating you to do right. You need both. But primarily we need to grow in the grace of God. We need to know that who God is and we need to know that he loves us and that there is nothing that we can do that would separate us from him. That we can be eternally secure in God and Christ Jesus. And then the last thing that he wants us to know is right there in the last little bit of the book. He says, to him be the glory both now and forever. Amen. And so he wants us, he wants us to be, for him to be glory both now and forever. And I just simply want to ask you this morning, is that the way it is with you? that you are giving glory to him, that you are his faithful servant, that you are following him. 
he encourages us in verse 14 to be vigilant, to be steadfast, to be looking forward to these things. What things is he wanting us to look forward to? It's the second coming. It's the time when the issues of life will be irrelevant for they will pass and we will step into that moment with him. Peter knew the fate that would befall him. He knew it was just around the corner. He was in the shadow of his own cross when he pens these beautiful words of Peter. But like him, he encourages us to remain faithful to the very end, fully assured of salvation. Please do the same as Peter. Hold on to that which you have. Hold on to the instructions of the prophets. Not give up. Don't let these false Christs, these false prophets and these false teachers come in and influence you away from this the word of God. May God bless us all today. Thank you, Jenny. Which Where are we going, Lockie? What's next? Oh, brother, be faithful. Wow. Yes. Beautiful. Well, our little time of worship today is taking me back to the 70s. It's the way we used to do it back then. The only thing that's missing is the elders sitting up here. I'll tell you a little story just before I do the benediction. There was one day we had our, visit, our, our local church pastor come down from Christchurch to worship with us. And we had Friday night together and Saturday morning, Sabbath morning, he got up, went in and had a shower. And we, said, we heard him say, oh, Liz, Liz, will you please pass me my suit? So she did. She went and got the suit and passed it in through the bathroom door. And next thing we hear... Hey, Liz, will you pass me the trousers, please? All she passed him was the jacket. Yeah, the trousers were still in Christchurch. <laughs> so he didn't have any trousers. He was the same size as me, so I loaned him a suit. So he puts my suit on. Beautiful. And so that's all right. Five minutes later, there's a knock on the door. It's my brother-in-law, who was also going to be on the rostrum that Sabbath. He had taken a suit to the dry cleaners on Thursday and forgot to pick it up on Friday. So he didn't have a suit. So he wanted to borrow my other suit. Fortunately, I had three suits. So that day, all three elders, all the three people up the front are in my suits. Yes, we have some fun times back then. God was good. But thank you for taking me back to 1970 and remembering those beautiful things that, that happened in life. Let's pray. Oh, loving Father. Thank you for these wonderful people that are here worshipping with you today. Thank you that they've come to an understanding that you are the most important being in their lives, that, that nothing can happen without you and that they are part of, of you and they're part of your family. And I just pray uh, that we will follow this counsel of Peter, that we'll hold on, hold on to that which has been established in our souls some of us might, might yet be established there. Some of us might even be learning how to get to that point where we can trust you totally, absolutely. And I just pray for any that are on that journey that you will open these windows of understanding and you'll give them the knowledge and light that will be, help them to be as confident as Peter was. Thank you for the confidence of Peter. And may we have that confidence too, but may we be on guard May we be prepared for what comes and may we, dear Lord, because of our faith in you, be protected from the evils of the evil one as he tries to smother out our salvation. And I pray this today in Jesus' name. Amen.